Welcome to Torah in the Courts of Heaven. This is the Torah portion Mishpatim. Mishpatim, which means judgments. So, not necessarily the subject that a lot of people would like to think about, although it's something that's very important in the Kingdom of God, because the Lord is not just merciful and indeed, his mercy endures forever. And he's not just kind. He's not just good. He also is a God of judgment and even a God one day of great wrath that will be for those who have never received him, who never trusted him. So today we want to be on the good side. We want to be on the right side of God's judgments and that means walking in the Torah. Now we understand, we know that our relationship with the Lord doesn't come from what we do for Him or even in obedience to Him because in actuality, we've all disobeyed and we've disobeyed to the point where there's no return. However, he made it possible because of his mercy, because of his kindness, and even above his judgments, he made a way back to him. And as we are restored, we then want to walk in his ways. And so we have to learn his ways because we don't totally know all of the Lord's ways. And this is what we want to do. Now, there's a well-known Jewish Midrash uh, if you're Jewish, you'd very well probably know this Midrash, but likely you've never heard it, but maybe you have. Uh, in Exodus 21.1, it says, Now these are the judgments which you shall set before them. So the Midrash is this. The Lord initially offered the Torah to each of his 70 nations, but none accepted it without asking first, what was it about? After hearing various commandments, each nation had some excuse for not accepting it. For example, the Ishmaelites declined because of its prohibition against theft, since their trading practice required theft. So God finally turned to the nation of Israel. And so, as you know, the Torah tells us that uh, the, all of the Jewish nation, all the Hebrew nation agreed whatever God says they would do. Now, we know that's not what happened, but they... That was their heart. Their heart was to agree and was to obey. But in actuality, just as with us, it's really not possible to totally obey the Lord. But we want to work and walk in that direction. As it says in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 6, that we want to return to the ancient paths, to the ways uh, that leads, the right ways that lead to Him. So we will truly obey or will we truly obey Yahweh? Exodus 24, 7 says, Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said we will do, as I just spoke a moment ago, and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant which Yahweh has made with you according to these words. Now, it's interesting because just as it is to be a believer and follower of Yeshua now, to be a Christian, as many would say, it means to, first of all, to agree that you are in the wrong, that you that what you're doing, uh, the way you're living your life is not adequate. It's not the way uh, to peace. It's not the way to the kingdom of God. It's not the way that leads unto righteousness. But you agree. This is what this is what they were doing. They agreed to obey. They agreed to whatever they were told from the Lord, they would obey because they trusted him, you see, as we also hopefully trust the Lord. And that's why we want to obey. But interestingly, is it was the blood. You see, once the blood was sprinkled, it was sealing the deal, you could say, you could so to speak, say, so to speak. Uh, and it is with the same with us, that it was the blood, it was the blood of Jesus, the blood of Yeshua, that we by faith 
have sprinkled over us that covers us from our sin and also enables us because of the power then of the Holy Spirit upon us and in us to go and actually do His commandments, to obey the Lord. And even with that power that we have in us, we so often still fail because we listen to the other voice, the voice of ourselves usually. Yes, sometimes it is the enemy's voice, but honestly, it's mostly our own voice. In in, in essence, our biggest enemy is usually ourself. Now I want to tell a short little story of Josiah and Joash. Now God, the one who actually really followed the Lord was Josiah. Josiah and then there was Joash. But Josiah is the one it mentions in 2 Kings chapter 23 and verse 4. And the king, which is Josiah, commanded Hilkiah, the high priest, the priest of the second order, and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles that were made for Baal, for Ashroth, and for all the host of heaven. And he burned them outside in Jerusalem, of Jerusalem in the fields of Kedron and carried away their ashes to Bethel. And then in verse 7, Then he tore down the ritual booths of the perverted persons that were in the house of Yahweh, where women wove hangings for the wooden image. Now this is... If you, when you understand this, you would begin to understand how horrific this was that this is being spoken of here. Because we're talking about, first of all, the kingdom of God represented in the temple of God on earth. Now, the, 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 the um, as Jesus even spoke, Yeshua spoke when he was here, when he came later, that don't you know? that the kingdom of God is here now. It's, it's inside of you. It's right here. Now, it's not here yet in its fullness as it will be, as what we long for, but it's coming. And so this temple was the place where God, His Spirit, dwelt. And during the times of the Tanakh, or what we would call the Old Testament. And what had happened is the people had gotten so far away from their relationship with Yahweh, with the Lord, and they begin to follow the dictates and oracles of evil, of Satan, which comes in the form of Baal and Ashroth and many other things, and the host of heaven and all these things that have nothing to do with God, but have everything to do with with evil, with, with selfishness, with serving yourself, and with doing every kind of profane and idolatrous activity. And it was so bad, in fact, that you, you saw in, in verse 7, in chapter 23, verse 7, that it talks about these ritual booths. So basically, if it's like, you you know, if you went to a flea market or some kind of a, a, a big uh, seminar, and often they divide up a large room with booths. They have different booths. And people have little, you know, temporary walls they put up and they sell their wares or they demonstrate what their activity is. And you can go from from booth to booth to booth like that. Well, what what this has done here is they've actually separated the temple of God with these booths. And these booths were actually being used in the perversion of worship of idols and false gods. And much of that included uh, temple prostitution. So it was connected to idolatrous and fornicative type of sexual perversions right there in the temple of God. And Josiah was the one who had all these things removed and cleaned out. So what's the point of that for us? Well, if we're not careful, little by little, we allow little rooms little booths. They don't come all at once, you see. They come one at a time. They come maybe two at a time, whatever. They come little by little until before you know it, we're infested with this idolatry of the evil one. And we actually have a hard time even finding where is God in our life anymore. But thanks be to God that we can return. Uh, we we go on into the New Testament of the Brit Shah, and 
one of the most wonderful things that Yeshua said is very simple. He said, follow me. Matthew 4, 19, he said, come, follow me, said Yeshua, and I will make you fishers of men. So the Lord wants you to follow him. And that means to do what he does, to be concerned what he's concerned with. And what he's concerned with is that other people would come to know him, that they would they would get away, they would escape the booths that are in their lives, the, the idolatry and the sin and the, and all this gore and, and grossness that, that inhabits people when they are away from God, when they don't know the Lord. And what happens when he comes in is he changes them inside out. He changes their heart and gives them a purpose. And his purpose, as he said here, I will make you fishers of men. He he wants to take you and make you useful for his kingdom so that he can set you free, but not just for yourself, so that you you then can go and show other people even how to be set free. But you have to be totally set free yourself first. You have to have every single booth, every single uh, idolatrous spot in your life removed and follow him. In Matthew chapter 8 and verse 22, he says it again. He says, follow me, Yeshua said to him, and leave the dead to bury their dead. Now he was talking to a man that he was saying, come and follow me. And the man had said to, back to him, back to Yeshua, well, I can't. I have uh, someone in his family had died and he had to go bury the dead. Okay, that's understandable. But Yeshua's making a point there that nothing is more important than being in his kingdom, than following the dictates and the rules of his kingdom. It's the most beautiful thing when everything else takes the back seat to following Yeshua. Truly, your life is enriched as it will never be before or never could be without him. When he comes into your life, there is total and complete and amazing change. Everything becomes new. And all that, that once you held dear becomes so less of importance. So now we're going to go to Matthew chapter 9 and verse 9. And Yeshua was passing by and he saw a man called Matthew, who actually was the writer of this book. And he says he was sitting at a tax office and he said to him, come follow me. Now understand that the tax collectors in this period, in the Roman period of Israel, when they were under Roman occupation and the Jews, you know, had very little freedom and they were being taxed by the Romans and some of the Jews, maybe they could get a little bit better of a position, a little better situation for them if they worked for the Romans. But you see, to work for the Romans was be a, a very terrible thing. You know, some of the Jews did the same thing in the Holocaust where uh, if they would help the Germans in some of their work, they might find a little better situation for themselves, whether as if they refused, then their situation would be very terrible. Even possibly they would be killed, uh, murdered. And of course, we know that happened to them, even if they did uh, do certain things. And it would be the same, much the same with the Romans. So you see, Matthew was a tax collector for the Romans, you see, and that's why it's not like when we look at a tax collector now. I mean, of course, there are some people who, you know, we don't like tax collectors because we don't want to pay taxes. But in all honesty, paying taxes in, in some ways is a, is a blessing because to pay taxes means you have an income and you have you have some wealth. You have a way to uh, to live, to to buy things and and whatnot. Uh, yes, we can say that our taxes are too high, but we've probably always said that as humans, that they're too high. Because if the money's not going to us, we don't really like it. If it's going to other things, even though it is often good things they go to. But in this case, that's not with the case with Matthew. Matthew was a, a tax collector working for the Romans. It didn't help the Jews whatsoever. So, but the point is, the situation that Matthew was in was probably better than many of his fellow Jewish people. But even taxes aren't as important as the Lord's kingdom. And that's what he's reminding us here. And you could say jobs, money, 
position, schooling, education, marriage, nothing, nothing in your life is as important as the kingdom of God in your life. And if if it's not that way, then your life is out of order. It's your priorities are incorrect. They may be close, but unless the kingdom of God is first place in your life, you have some adjustments you need to do between you and the Lord. You can be angry at me if you want. It's totally fine. I'm used to it. But the point is, it's not for, for, for you to be mad at me. It's for you to see that Yeshua wants first place in your life. It's the most beautiful thing when that happens for you. And it's the best for him too. Matthew sixteen twenty four. Then Yeshua said to his disciples, If any man wishes to come after me, let him renounce himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoa, that's what I just touched on, just kind of briefly. But it's so much deeper. If we really, really want to um, the best life we can have, if we really want to be all in, as I hear some people say now, it's kind of the, the catchphrase, one of the catchphrases of our day, to be all in. Well, if we're truly going to be all in, we have to be totally surrendered. And the surrender comes to the Lord. And we do it by listening to the Spirit of God in our lives and asking Him and saying to Him, Lord, I commit my life to you. And it's a daily thing. It's a moment by moment thing. It's not just a time that you did it once and you're saved and you're born again. It's a thing that's for the rest of your life. To follow Him for the rest of your life. Give everything to Him because He is worthy. He is worthy.